Hey everybody, this is Patrick JMT and I'm partnering with Chegg, and here we're going to start looking at Stokes' Theorem. So I'll try to give the idea loosely behind Stokes' Theorem, and then we'll use Stokes' Theorem to evaluate a couple of integrals. So let's talk about Green's Theorem first, because there's definitely some relationships here. So Green's Theorem makes the connection between a double integral over a plane region D to a line integral around its plane boundary curve. And these are sort of, it's sort of like a, a higher dimension analog to the fundamental theorem of calculus because the fundamental theorem of calculus says if you integrate a derivative, you somehow get back what you, where, where you started. And it's the same idea here. So we've got a derivative, an integral of a derivative, and somehow we're getting back um, information of the original function. So it's interesting because, at least to me it's interesting, because you, you can get information about this double integral over this entire plane region just by knowing information about its boundary curve. So Stokes' theorem relates a surface integral over a surface S to a line integral around the boundary of S. So let's talk about a few things here. So I've got my uh, surface S here. I've got this boundary curve that goes around it. We'll talk about the direction here in a second. So let S be an, an oriented piecewise smooth surface that's bounded by a simple closed piecewise smooth curve C with a positive orientation. So here's our normal vector in, our unit normal vector in. The idea is if it's, if, you're, uh, if it's got a positive orientation, what that means is you can imagine if you're walking along the boundary curve, if you're walking along the boundary curve so that your head is pointing in the same direction as the normal vector, when you walk around the curve, that surface is always going to be on your left side. Okay, so let f be a vector field whose components have continuous partial derivatives on an open region in R3 that contains s. Then we get this relationship. Okay, so we'll use these to compute some, some integrals. Okay, so suppose that uh, our vector field f is equal to yzi plus xzj plus xyk, and s is the part of the paraboloid z equals 9 minus x squared minus y squared that lies above the plane z equals 5 oriented upwards. So I'm going to use this, uh, this formula to help us compute this. So we'll have to find a couple things first. So our R of t is going to be related to the boundary curve. Okay, so if we think about, okay, so the plane z equals 5 is going to intersect this paraboloid. So if that happens, well, 5 would equal 9 minus x squared minus y squared. This is where we're going to get our boundary curve for. So notice I can add x squared uh, and y squared to both sides. I can subtract 5. I'll get x squared plus y squared equals 4, and it's intersecting at the plane z equals 5, so I'm getting this, this circle that's sitting at a height of z equals 5. So I need to come up with a parametrization for that curve. This is our boundary curve c, and that's what I'm trying to find. Uh, that's what my r of t is going to equal. So r of t in this case, I think we can use the following parametrization. It's always a hard word for me to say. So we could use 2 times cosine of t and 2 times sine of t, right? That's going to give us our circle, because if we square those, 2 cosine squared plus um, 2 sine squared is going to give me the equation of our circle. We still need to account that it's sitting at a height of 5. So our, our z component is going to be equal to 5. OK, so our vector field uh, has components yz, xz, and whoops, yes, xy. Make sure I get those down there correctly. So a couple things here. So I can compute our, our prime of t because, again, I need that in our formula. So if I take the derivative of that, we'll get, what, negative 2 sine t. We'll get 2 cosine of t. And then the last component will be 0 since our, we just have a constant there. So if I do f of r of t, okay, so that says we're going to multiply the y and z components. So x, y, and z. So if I multiply the y and z components, I'm going to get 10 times 
sine of t. Next, it says we multiply the x and the z components. So that'll be 10 times cosine of t. And then we do x times y, which is going to be 4 times um, cosine of t times sine of t. OK, so we've got our r prime. So when we go to set up our integral, since we're going uh, around this entire circle, we're going to be integrating from 0 to 2 pi. And again, we take f of r of t, and we have to dot that with the derivative. OK, so if we do that, recall that we're just simply, uh, well, let's just write it down here. We're multiplying respective components. So we set our f of r of t, that's 10 times sine t, 10 cosine t, 4 cosine t, sine t. And that's going to be dotted with the derivative, which is negative 2 sine t, 2 cosine t, and 0. OK, so we multiply respective components. So if we do that, now we're doing a dot product. So we'll get, what is this, negative 20 times sine squared of t. So I'm multiplying this component by this component. And remember, when you um, do a dot product, you no longer have vectors. So we're getting rid of those. We would have plus 20 times cosine squared of t. And notice our last component, since we're uh, multiplying or our last term, since we're multiplying by 0, one of those components is 0, we'll just get a plus 0. OK, so now this is what we have to integrate with respect to t. So now we've kind of done, done the legwork in, in, in some respects. So let me see if I can't squeeze all this in here. So what did I do here? Um, I integrated, or let's see, first uh, we'll simplify. So I pulled out the 20. This is from 0 to 2 pi. <clears throat> so we could write this as cosine squared t minus sine squared t dt. And we've got a nice identity for that. So that's simply going to be equal to, so there's a trig identity for cosine squared minus sine squared. And that's going to be cosine of 2t dt. So I've got my 20. I can find the antiderivative of cosine of 2t. That's simply going to be equal to sine of 2t over 2. And we would evaluate that from 0 to 2 pi. So what is that going to give us? So the 20 over 2, that'll be 10. We would have sine of, OK, so when I plug in 2 pi, that's going to be sine of 4 pi minus sine of, OK, we'll plug in our lower limit of integration. We'll get sine of 0. And are all these zeros? Yeah, so um, sine of 0 is 0. Sine of 4 pi would also be 0. So in this case, it looks like our value is simply going to be equal to 0. So OK, so um, I think a lot of times getting these set up, uh, at least for this, you know, you got to find a parametrization for your boundary curve. So again, make sure you can do that. If it's circles, you've got something to do with, with you know, cosines and sines floating around in there. Um, and then after that, it's just kind of filling in this formula, taking the dot product, simplifying, and cleaning it up. So let's look at another example here. And here we've got the vector field f uh, equals e to the negative xi plus e to the xj plus e to the zk. I've got it written here in component form. And c is going to be the boundary of the part of the plane 2x plus y plus 2z equals 2 in the first octant. So I've got that graphed here. So one thing that I found is this curve in the xy plane. That's going to come in useful here in a second. That's going to be y equals 2 minus 2x. And if we want to think about our surface, so our surface z, I could solve for that. We've got 2x plus y plus 2z equals 2. Well, if you solve for z, we'll get z equals 1 minus x minus 1 half y. So we'll come back and use that in a second. So I'm going to evaluate this now, um, thinking about it using this formula. OK, so let's see here. So, so we've got the curl of f 
dotted with ds. Now I'm going to make use of the uh, formula. Maybe you saw this in surface when you talk about surface integrals. So for surface integrals, it says if we have uh, f dotted with s or ds, the formula we can use for that is okay, we're integrating over some region D in the plane, and D is going to be that region in the xy plane, and we come up with the following formula. So we have negative P times the partial of G with respect to x minus Q multiplied by the partial of G with respect to y plus R. We're integrating again over that area, that region D, and in this case, our G of x, our G is going to be our function of xy, which again corresponds to our, our z, which is why we have this. This is going to be our function, g. And our vector field f, that's going to have components p, q, and r. OK, so I need to come up with our vector field f. And our vector field f, in this case, is going to be the curl of f. So the first thing we need to compute is the curl of f. And recall that the curl of f, that's simply equal to delta del crossed with f. So in this case, we've got to do a cross product. So we've got i, j, and k. We take, uh, so del is the partial with respect to x, the partial with respect to y, the partial with respect to z. And we use the, the components of f. So we'll use those. So let's see, so that was e to the negative x, e to the x, and e to the z. I think I got those right. Yeah, e to the negative x, e to the x, and e to the z. So you can check my, my cross product here. So this is going to be the partial with respect to y of e to the z minus the partial with respect to z of e to the x multiplied by i. Minus, next we'll take the partial with respect to x of e to the z minus the partial with respect to z of e to the negative x times j. And if you've forgotten how to do cross products, I certainly have videos of those. We'll take the partial with respect to x of e to the x minus the partial with respect to y of e to the negative x multiplied by k. So notice a lot of these terms are going to be zero, right? The partial with respect to y of e to the z, well, we're treating the e to the z like a constant. That's going to be zero. This will be zero. This will be zero. This will be zero. Okay, we've got the partial with respect to x of e to the x. Well, that's going to leave me with an e to the x. I'm taking the partial with respect to y of e to the negative x. That's just going to be zero. So we have e to the x uh, multiplied by k. So there's the i component, the j component, the k component. All right, so where are we at here? So this is now, that's my curl, but this is going to be using our notation here. This is going to be like our vector f when we do our, um, uh, use our other formula here. So we set our surface that we're using. This was our surface. And again, it's bounded in this region in the plane. Well, let me draw that a little better. It's bounded by this region in the plane. So we can use that to produce our limits of integration. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, okay, so we're over this region, D. So we're going to integrate with respect to x and with respect to y. So again, we had that z was equal to... Where'd it go? 1 minus x minus 1 half y. So we can compute if we take the, and again, they label this as a function g often when they talk about surface integrals. So if we take the partial of g with respect to x, that's simply going to leave us with negative 1. The partial of g with respect to y, that's going to be equal to negative 1 half. So it says we do negative p. So this is our p, our q, and our r. Maybe it's worth filling in. So you would have a negative 0 times the partial of g with respect to x, which is negative 1. We would have 
minus q, which again is 0 times the partial of g with respect to y, which is negative 1 half. And then it's plus the r component, which is going to be e to the x. And then we're going to integrate with respect to y with respect to x. So if I integrate, if I integrate with respect to y, that's coming from the, so you can think about this curve and this curve. Those will be our inner limits of integration. So our lower limit of integration in this case is going to be 0. The upper limit of integration will be that line, 2 minus 2x. Um, yes, 2 minus 2x. And when we integrate with respect to x, well, our smallest x-coordinate is going to be 0. Our largest x-coordinate is going to be 1. So this is from 0 to 1. So it looks like we're just integrating from 0 to 1, from 0 to 2 minus 2x. It looks like the only thing we're left with is e to the x dy dx, which that's friendly after all that other legwork to get here. Okay, so let's see if we can't compute this. This is from 0 to 1. If I integrate e to the x with respect to y, I'm treating e to the x like a constant. So I'll get e to the x times y. I've got to evaluate that from 0. Um, and maybe we'll even emphasize from y equals 0 to y equals 2 minus 2x dx. So when I substituted that in, I get from 0 to 1, I'll have e to the x. When I substitute in my upper limit of integration, we'll have 2 minus 2x. The lower limit of integration, when I plug in 0, we'll just get 0. So now we have to integrate that with respect to x. And when you integrate this, this is 2 e to the x, which is no problem, minus 2 times x multiplied by e to the x dx. Okay, so the first part's easy. To integrate the second part, you just use integration by parts. Um, I'm not going to show all the gory details on that one. I assume if you've made it this far, you're probably okay. Or we could have just done integration by parts, honestly, at, at the very beginning if you wanted to. Either way. So after I did integration by parts and simplified, I got 2 minus 2x multiplied by e to the x. And really, I just did integration by parts here. Um, plus 2 times e to the x from 0 to 1. And when I plugged in those uh, limits of integration and simplified it down, I got this to be equal to 2 times e minus 4 as the solution. So, okay, a couple little examples. Um, notice we used slightly different techniques in both of them. Uh, a lot of things to remember here, a lot of things to keep track of, a lot of little things to, to do. You know, you've got to find these boundary curves. You need to be able to express those in component form. Um, you know, for something like this, right, you, you know, this is a pretty basic function that you would be expected to graph to get this this plane, you know, and again, I've got that in the first quadrant. And we need that, again, to come up with the, um, the boundary curves, or limits of integration, this function g that we used in this formula. So make sure you can remember, you know, you know how to find the curl using cross products. So lots of little things to keep track of in this. So again, there's certainly many more things to talk about in relationship to Stokes' theorem, but I think this is a good place to start, and I do hope that these examples help you out.